Hello, hello. Can everyone um, take their seats now, please? We're, we're ready to, to uh, get started for the next um, Conservative Environment Network uh, event titled Grown in Britain, the Future for Our Land and Food. Um, I'm James Cullimore. I run the Natural Environment Programme here at SEN. Uh, for those who aren't familiar with the Conservative Environment Network, we're the independent forum for conservatives who believe in net zero, nature restoration and resource security. Uh, and you can find our full event uh, uh, party conference program on the uh, leaflets on your seats or by visiting our website or, of course, in the, your uh, conference uh, program. Um, I'm going to firstly thank you, thank our sponsor, Vertical Future, um, for enabling us to put on uh, this event uh, today. And we've got a distinguished uh, panel to uh, discuss these issues. We're going to start with opening remarks, um, starting with uh, the new farming minister, Mark Spencer. Uh, we will then, I will then ask some questions from uh, the chair, and we will uh, then go to you for your questions, so please have them ready. I'm going to try and take them in batches of three or four so we can get through as many uh, as possible, so please be ready with your questions and keep them brief, please. We want questions, not statements. Um, but a bit of context behind this um, discussion today. So with the, the war in Ukraine and also uh, extreme heat waves across the world, uh, we've seen real disruption to food supplies uh, this year. And coming off the back of uh, the pandemic, there's a real focus now on security and resilience to shocks. Um, and so uh, alongside that, in this country, we're also phasing out um, EU-style lamb subsidies and moving to our new post-Brexit uh, farm subsidy, uh, farm payment uh, regime. And that has attracted some criticism uh, from farmers who at the same time are grappling with uh, labour shortages, rising input costs, and also new trade deals um, as well. So how can we boost our domestic food security and deliver better outcomes for the environment? Uh, this panel will discuss sustainable food production, uh, support for farmers um, to manage the change with uh, new technologies and new uh, farm payments and incentives coming uh, on board, and also the role of new production methods, uh, most notably uh, vertical uh, farming. So firstly, I'm going to turn to uh, the Farm Minister, Mark Spencer, who's going to deliver some remarks. Unfortunately, the Minister will then have to leave as he has other commitments, but we're very grateful um, to the Minister for uh, being with us today and uh, speaking with us. So over to you. Thank you, uh, thank you James. And I, I apologise for not being able to stay for the, uh, for the whole session, but I just wanted to uh, stay up and say I uh, wish the session well. I think it's hugely important. Uh, we've got massive challenges uh, in the food production sector at the moment in terms of uh, rising costs. And you'll have seen some speculation in the press that we're uh, about to tear up completely our environmental credentials and uh, move in a different direction. I can assure you that is absolutely not the case. Uh, I, I think uh, the government and the Conservative Party is committed to protecting our environment, looking after our food producers, and making sure that we have a sustainable future. Uh, that goes hand in hand with our farmers and our food producers who also have those aspirations and those desires. I think, um, you know, it, it strikes me as ironic sometimes that uh, we, we criticise our farmers for damaging the beautiful countryside when actually it's the the farmers of generations that have created that beautiful countryside that we hold so dear you know the the, the stone walls in Yorkshire are only there to keep in the sheep without those sheep the stone walls are not necessary and will not be maintained and I think that's the same for landscapes up and down the country whether you look at Dartmoor or Exmoor or Snowdonia those beautiful landscapes we hold so dear are created by our food producers uh, and our farmers and we want them to continu continue to do that we want them to be profitable we want them to engage and enhance that biodiversity and the opportunities that the uh, environment brings them I think we can do that but in order for them to do that the schemes that we put forward have got to be accessible they've got to be easy to engage with and they've got to be attractive to those to those farmers and unless we do that then they won't participate and we won't have the positive effect that we want to have uh, I think there's huge opportunities moving forward. I look forward to hearing what the session comes up with, and I know that uh, Joe or Jerome uh, will feed back to me any comments that uh, they need to directly. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Thank you, Minister. Um, excellent. Right, we are going to go to our uh, uh, second speaker for today. Uh, Jerome Mayhew uh, has been MP for Broadland in Norfolk since 2019 uh, and is currently a member of the Environmental Audit Committee. Uh, he is also chair of the Sustainable Finance APPG, vice chair of the APPG for the Environment and APPG for Rural Businesses and Rural Powerhouse and a very active member of the same caucus. Jerome, over to you. 
Well, thank you very much, James, and thank you very much uh, for coming to this event. Uh, the, the areas that I want to talk about, and we've just got three minutes, is uh, looking at some of the regulatory changes that we can affect in order to uh, deal with the challenges we've got in uh, UK agriculture, and also how that can improve agricultural performance uh, in a wider world where there's uh, food scarcity and particularly uh, accommodating increased drought measures. So that's one thing. I then want to talk about the economy, market signals. That will take up my three minutes. So let's start with regulations. There is, in, just outside my constituency, a place called the John Innes Centre, which is the world's foremost uh, developer of gene editing. So gene editing is where you can essentially accelerate the natural breeding processes to get benign characteristics in, in plant species, and also um, you can do it in animals as well. This will allow us at the John Innes Centre and elsewhere to develop uh, drought-resistant wheat, for example, um, and other products which will uh, encourage, will, will support the uh, agricultural industry here in the UK, but also has a huge uh, potential globally to support um, the, the poor and the food hungry. We are bringing in the genetic technology precision breeding regulations to allow, to allow gene editing. Please don't confuse that with genetic modification. It is different. It's where you have the same species being uh, repeatedly uh, bred from. So that's one aspect where the government can, can get regulations out of the way to allow science to help farmers, both in this country and abroad. There's also, if, it, if uh, some of you here would have been to Groundswell, which is a conference on regenerative agriculture, which takes place in Ware in Hertfordshire each year. When I was there in the summer, you could see in the technical um, uh, exhibits the huge explosion of new technology of uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, the use of drones uh, to undertake uh, low impact uh, pesticide, pesticide and insecticide free or much reduced use of, of insecticides to improve uh, agricultural productivity. So there's, it's, it's necessary for the Environment Agency and the HSE to recognise that the market is moving. We have to have regulations and oversight to make sure that these new sectors are welcomed but still, um, we need to make sure that they're safe and that they're, well, they're, they're safe for the operators and also for the wider environment. But we need to uh, recognize that this is an accelerating area where we want to work in, in collaboration with industry, with the agricultural industry, and not uh, be held back by a lack of, a lack of uh, imagination. Now I'm gonna come on to market signals. In the mini budget about 10 days ago, there was a lot of criticism uh, around economic development zones and there was a concern that these might have a negative impact on environmental protection. I've got direct experience of one of these in my constituency, and it's called the Food Enterprise Park. Now, this is an area of 100 acres in Broadland where there's a development consent order for the entire 100 acres. And as a re direct result of that, two weeks ago, the world's largest vertical farm opened. It's four acres. It's by Fisher Farms. And I've spoken, I've been to it twice. Uh, Tristan Fisher, who's the chief executive, the only reason why he came there, he's told me this in terms, was because it was easy, because we'd, we'd accelerated the process by which you can have the idea and move through construction and therefore production. Because as a former businessman, I can tell you definitively that time <coughs> kills deals. If we, can, if we can speed up the process by which innovative agricultural and environmental procedures can be adopted and made a commercial return, we will get growth, but we will also, very importantly, importantly get the improved uh, uh, environmental uh, outcome from that vertical farm, because that's four acres. It will produce the same economic, um, sorry, agricultural output as a thousand acres of broad acre farming, and it will use less than 10% of the water to produce um, the the, out the outputs. That is hugely important. It's hugely important in East Anglia, where, we have, where we're water poor, but it's also enormously important for the future of farming. And then finally, if I've got time, yep. a wider signal. So we've got e economic development zones, but there's a wider signal. We need to understand how free markets work, and they respond to opportunities and threats. And to, to give the right information to free markets, we need a price for carbon. We need a price for carbon to unlock the power of the free market so that every industry can make 
thousands upon thousands of individual decisions that recognize the true cost of the activity that they're undertaking. And to facilitate that, in my submission, we need something called a carbon border adjustment mechanism so that we apply a price for carbon, not just for our domestic industry, but for imports, crucially important, that imports have a level playing field with the domestic manufacturing or, um, or agricultural um, industry. And it is that way that we can reinvigorate domestic manufacturing whilst recognizing the true cost of carbon and unlocking the power of the free market to start solving some of these environmental problems which, because of poor information, they have caused over the last 200 years. Fantastic, Jane. That was uh, brilliant and really interesting to hear about how regulatory reform can incentivise uh, new technologies which can improve productivity and reduce environmental impacts, the importance of market reform for attracting green investment and green business, and the importance of a carbon price for sending those uh, signals um, to, 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 through the, the, the market. Uh, I'm now going to come to Joe Gideon, uh, who was elected as MP for Stoke-on-Trent Central in 2019 and was formerly the chair of the APPG on the National Food Strategy. Before entering Parliament, she served as a local councillor for 13 years in Thanet and Ashford and owned a handmade paper import and wholesale business for 10 years. Uh, Joe, over to you. Thank you very much. Um, so I, I'm here really because of my, my interest in food and the food system. Um, I think uh, we all recognise that, um, as Henry will, will tell you afterwards, um, the food system is, is broken. And um, part of that is uh, our understanding of... Uh, land use, of um, food security. There, there are a number of issues that we need to address globally. But um, nationally, I think that we need to have a, a much bigger conversation around um, what we produce, what we farm, yeah. land use. Um, you know, clearly you've got the, the, the three challenges. You've got the, the, the food challenge, you've got climate change challenges, and you've got um, the nature recovery challenge of um, years of... Uh, quite frankly, not, um, not really focusing on, on this, this issue enough. Um, and I think that when we look at this, to, to find solutions, we need to have much bigger conversations. Uh, so, for instance, I, I give an example. A, a local councillor um, from somewhere in the West Country said, we've just given planning permission for 6,000 homes in, in my area. Um, and now they've come back and they want to have a planning commission for a very large solar farm on you know, Greenbelt land next door to it. Um, should we give it or should we have actually required them to put the solar panels on top of the, the houses when they built them? And you know, that goes to the heart of a fundamental question, which is um, we, we know that we need to use um, to land, land for uh, some of our renewables uh, requirements. We've got you know, biofuel growing, we've got solar farms across the country, and um, I know that um, certainly the Labour Party are very keen on, on the massive expansion of onshore wind, um, which has an implication for land use. Uh, and I think that we need to have much bigger conversations around um, how this all fits together. Uh, I was talking to a, a, a farmer at a, 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 an event in Parliament recently, and he said, look, we're really keen to do the right thing, we just need you to tell us what the right thing is. And I think that's the thing, isn't it? That, that there's nobody, um, as, as the minister said, you know, farmers traditionally are custodians of our countryside. Um, they are the ones that, that, that actually make sure things um, are as they should be. But, um, but they need guidance. And I think that we, um, well, I say we, I'm on the backbencher, so I, don't, I can't really say we, but the government needs to, to, to be part of that bigger conversation. Um, and the bigger conversation is also around what we grow in terms of healthy food and diet and dietary change because you know we have and one of my other passions uh, talking about food is the challenge that we have with obesity in this country and, and the fact that, that diet needs to change we need to, to have um, more plant-based diet and therefore you know what we grow will change with that as well um, so really looking at the, the bigger picture um, I represent a, a, an urban constituency. There are, I think there are four farms in Stoke on Trent Central. Haven't found them yet. There must be very small ones. Um, <laughs> you know, they certainly are not sort of uh, large land holdings. Um, but um, the relationship that, that people in, 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 in my constituency have with food has to be has to be helped by this big bigger dialogue. So I'm really interested to hear about the vertical farming 
um, piece, and um, I'm really keen to see um, shops growing um, tomatoes up the walls in the middle of my city centre, because I think that we need to also take food production into different areas, different parts of the country, and reconnect people with food and the countryside through uh, new technologies and new innovations. So um, th I think there's a, there's, this is such a massive subject. Um, I, I'm privileged to, to sit on, on this panel with so many um, experts, and, and I just sit there really as somebody who goes, we've got to do something about this. And uh, there is no single piece of the food production um, organization or energy producers that can answer it on the, on their on their own so this has got to be a collaboration it's got to be a really big conversation and we should have had it by now henry i think we agree but you know it's never too late to, to, to start in, in a meaningful way fantastic joan and hopefully this uh, this is the first conversation uh, of many um and really uh, interesting uh, and important concepts that you set out there around those some of those competing uh, land uses and the importance of balancing our need for food uh, energy housing and, and conservation i'm now going to come to uh, henry dimbleby um who co-founded the leon restaurant chain uh, is a lead non-executive board member at the department for food environment food and rural affairs uh, and led the independent review of the national food strategy. Henry, over to you. Thank you very much. I think it's worth just reminding ourselves what the problem is we're trying to solve. So since 1945, uh, the food system has changed beyond all recognition and it is actually in, in many respects one of the great uh, innovative successes of humankind. We now feed 7.8 billion people from actually slightly less land than fed 2.5 <laughs> Uh, billion people in 1945 and we actually produce 1.7 times the number of calories per person on the planet uh, than we did back then but in creating that revolution in focusing on yield above all else which was you know there was an existential threat in 1945 a real genuine fear of a Malthusian collapse of the human species uh, we inadvertently caused other problems so the food system is by far, without any other um, competing uh, area of activity of human life, the biggest cause of biodiversity collapse. It's the biggest cause of freshwater stress and freshwater pollution. Uh, it's the biggest cause of deforestation. And with energy, it's one of the two big uh, causes of climate change globally. In fact, one of the biggest risks to the current food system is climate change, which it itself is causing. And on the other side, which we won't talk about today, it is also uh, by far the biggest cause of avoidable disease. By 2035, the NHS thinks it's going to spend more treating type 2 diabetes alone, one tiny condition caused by bad food, than it does today on all cancers. So the question is, can we take this food system that we've created... Uh, which produces all this fantastic variety of food and also uh, get it to restore biodiversity and to sequester carbon. We actually need the land on which we produce food not just to be carbon zero, you know, never minding how admirable the NFU's vision of this, we actually need it to be carbon negative because there are significant parts of the economy that are going to continue to emit carbon. And the answer and the, the analysis that we did is that yes you can actually if you look at this country 20% uh, of our farmland produces about 3% of our calories uh, there is a very close overlap between areas where which are suited to restoring biodiversity and sequestering carbon and you can do the maths where you create a kind of range of different farms from agroecological because there are whole different ecosystems that live on that kind of farming to more sustainable, high yielding farms, produce enough food uh, and sequester carbon and restoring biodiversity. We calculated that uh, of the 70% of land that is currently farmed, you might go down to about 65%, about 5% of land would go back to uh, broadleaf woodland, maybe some conservation grazing, um, and then you would have this range of, of, of other farming types. The question then is, how do you make that happen? And actually, really interestingly, the one thing that I think almost everyone agrees on on Brexit is it gave us the power to make this change. And what is exciting about being British is we're pretty much the only country that can show that this is possible. 
but it takes a, uh, an extraordinary, it, the landing strip, as we're seeing in the last couple of weeks, of bringing the environmental organisations on side, keeping the farmers on side, it's a very, very difficult thing to do. The landing strip is very narrow, and the risk is, and what I'm terrified about at the moment, we go back to a basic payment system effectively, and then what happens is uh, when the Treasury comes back to look and they say to DEFRA, what have you done? You know, we said you could keep the 2.5 billion of common agricultural policy money, and the, uh, DEFRA is unable to say, uh, look at the nature we've restored. Uh, you then get a, uh, a complete collapse of funding from Treasury. The Treasury will say it's not 2.4 billion, it's 1.8 billion. I'm constantly saying to Manette Batters, stop telling them to try and delay it because you are going to regret that. That is going to end in your funding being cut. So at the moment, when we talk, and just kind of come back to your original question, when we talk about food security and worries about food security, there are two significant and uh, real problems with food security in this country. One is food prices. Uh, for the, for the, the least affluent 5% of the country, most of us it's about 10% lower it's ever been. For them, it's 30% going up to 40%. That is not going to be solved by giving basic payments to farmers. Uh, the other problem is that we actually end up with an ecosystem that can't support farming in the future, and that needs to be solved by a double down, doubling down on elms. So it is very difficult. It's a difficult climate, and I wish this administration, this new administration, all the wisdom and political spirit and nous to land it. Because if we do land it, uh, we will have led the way and we will have shown the world that this is possible. Thank you, Henry. And you've certainly given them a significant helping hand through the, the National Food Strategy, which is a fantastic uh, and incredibly com comprehensive piece uh, of work. And for those who, who haven't read it yet or, or have, aren't familiar with the recommendations, I do, re do suggest that you, you take a look. Uh, I'm now going to turn to, to Eamon Ives, who's Head of Research at the Entrepreneurs Network. Uh, Eamon was formerly Head of Energy and the Environment at the Centre for Policy Studies and Special Advisor to the COP26 President. Uh, Eamon, over to you. Thank you. It's great to be here. And thank you to Sen for all the stuff you've been doing, not least during the leadership election this year. Um, I was a little bit worried that Jerome would take uh, the thrust of what I wanted to say in my own speaking remarks, but I think we just about uh, avoided that. I do want to talk about genetic editing. Um, and because we've got two parliamentarians on this panel, um, I'd like to talk about a piece of legislation currently going through the House Commons uh, called the Genetic Technology Precision Breeding Bill, very snappily named. Um, I think if we get this legislation right, it would be a huge boost to not only the UK's food security, but also its environmental um, credentials as well. Uh, in a nutshell, this uh, bill will set out the rules and regulations which apply to genetic ed editing, um, a real Brexit opportunity um, for the UK. Um, for the uninitiated, and Jerome kind of touched upon this already, but there are... Uh, genetic editing kind of a, refers to the process of when plants or animals kind of have their genetic code slightly tweaked to uh, promote certain desirable characteristics. Um, and the benefits they could offer are numerous and significant. So, for example, what if we were to breed crops which require less fertilizer? Um, the production of fertilizer is in itself a massive driver of climate change, and when it's uh, perhaps misused or, or applied badly onto fields, it can cause dramatic uh, devastation for lakes and rivers and, and things like that, which I think has become a hugely salient political issue lately. Um, what if we were to breed crops which are more resilient to drought and drier conditions? Um, we only have to think back to the summer to, to remember those stiflingly hot days um, that uh, devastated some farmers' um, crops and, and, the, and the harvests. Uh, I think that's only going to become more commonplace, so we need to think about how we can adapt to that um, hotter world. Um, we could use genetic editing to make plants uh, more resilient to pests or diseases. Um, this could dramatically cut the need for pesticides, um, something which would be a blessing for Britain's pollinator species, um, which all too often get caught in the chemical crossfire. Um, above all else, genetic editing would allow us to... Um, uh, get much higher yields, um, so more food per acre um, that's farmed. With that uh, farmland, we could um, perhaps restore some to nature, maybe planting trees on it, which can absorb uh, carbon from the atmosphere, or we could keep that land in production, um, bolstering our food security. Um, some people have voiced their opposition to genetic editing, um, perhaps saying it's unnatural or something like that, but I'm afraid that's a, a, a total misunderstanding of the science, to be quite blunt. 
Um, anything genetic editing can achieve can be achieved um, just through uh, sort of normal conventional selective breeding, which we've been doing for millennia. Um, the thing that genetic edit editing does is it allows us to have more control over that process. So uh, if anything, it's actually um, a more uh, a safer um, way of um, hopefully getting those desirable characteristics that we want to see. Um, as I say, the, the genetic technology bill is going through Parliament at the moment, so um, I think for the sake of our environment, it's, it's critical that it completes that journey um, roughly in the form that it, it currently exists. Um, so I was going to say to wrap up, my plea goes to Joe and Jerome to please make sure it does. It sounds like, Jerome, I, <laughs> you're already convinced of its merit. I hope you are as well, Joe, um, because I, like I said, I think it's, it's a really important um, bill at the moment. Um, I'm quite confident it will get passed um, in, in, a, in a good way, um, but you should never get complacent in politics. Thanks very much, Eamon. Uh, that was a brilliant exposition of the environmental uh, and food security benefits of precision breeding uh, technologies and a really important piece of legislation going through Parliament uh, at the moment. Finally, we're going to turn to, to Jamie Burrows, uh, founder and CEO of Vertical Future. Uh, prior to setting up Vertical Future, he worked in life sciences at EY, uh, Deloitte uh, and the UK Department of Health. Jamie is also a graduate of the prestigious Leadership Enrichment and Development uh, Programme in the US. Uh, uh, Air Force Academy and holds an honorary bachelor's degree in business economics from Buckingham University and a master's in energy, trade and finance from the Cass Business School. Jamie, over to you. Thanks very much and uh, thank you for the invite today and um, yeah, for reading through my bio, which is very exhaustive <laughs> and has nothing to do with vertical farming, but uh, I'll, uh, I'll take people through this. So I'm going to talk a little bit about um, our company and why we do what we do and some of the challenges and opportunities that exist right now in the um, agricultural sector and specifically for vertical farming for obvious reasons. Uh, so vert um, Vertical Future was set up in 2016. We're a, a technology and R&D company. Uh, that um, have about 100 staff, and um, we supply vertical farming technologies across the world. So our main uh, kind of target geographies are obviously UK and mainland Europe, the Middle East, and Singapore. Obviously today we're going to very much focus the conversation on, on Britain. Um, so one of the reasons I got interested in vertical farming, coming from kind of a health background, is because it addresses so many important issues, not just in terms of planetary health, but in terms of human health. If you look at the, the current state of the food system and the way this has been for decades now since the kind of agricultural revolutions of the 60s and 70s, we, it appears to be sustainable for things like organic products, but isn't necessarily. So as an example, you know, we, we fly herbs in from, from Kenya. We fly cut flowers in um, from Kenya via uh, Holland. Um, a lot of that's coming, you know, it's coming through a cold supply chain and then companies are spending hundreds of millions of pounds a year just storing these products in the UK to get them to, to customers. Uh, we're covering our products in pesticides. Pesticides have been linked to numerous health conditions, uh, infertil infertility being uh, one of them. Um, and is, is, this is really something that we should take more seriously. Um, then there's obviously land use, so um, vertical farms can't grow everything, or they can grow everything, but it wouldn't make sense to, um, because the economics wouldn't stack up. But of the products that can be grown, if you walk through a fresh produce aisle, and you look at probably about a third of the products can be grown sustainably in vertical farms, and at a, at a price parity to foreign imports, if you set up a decent sized farm, a bit like what Fisher Farms uh, have, have done. Um, so, you know, our systems, for example, can um, produce the same amount in, sorry, 600 times the amount in the same uh, space of land. So the good thing about that is it, we're freeing up land for obviously, um, you know, uh, improvements in biodiversity, which is a very, very important thing. Um, so human health angle, uh, freeing up land, having shorter supply chains, um, I, I think uh, CO2 related to um, kind of bringing products from places like Spain and Kenya is still a very small proportion of, of the overall kind of carbon footprint associated with, with vertical farms, but is nevertheless very important. In terms of the challenges that we've, we've faced over the, the past, I'd say, decade or so, um, since this has become very kind of attractive, mostly driven by uh, investment in US companies, um, one of them has obviously been um, investment. So uh, I, th I think we're finding that if we were speaking to to venture capital and PE firms two to three years ago, they'd, they'd be looking at like a VC or PE investment. They'd expect a two to three year exit on a you know, three to four X multiple. Now we're actually seeing a lot of infrastructure companies get involved in this. Um, on, on your seat, you'll see a, a pamphlet uh, which talks about one of the projects we're doing about uh, 15 miles away from Birmingham, 
where we're building a, uh, a large vertical farm, which is literally hole in the wall approach. You, you, um, you grow your products on site, they go through the wall, and we're working with a, uh, one of the leading recipe box companies and a major retailer. And I think what we've seen from Fisher Farms, and also I'm glad that we're talking a bit about genetics as well. We've, we've done a lot of research in this area as well. Every year we're seeing larger and larger vertical farms being built. But with this, we need more capital investment, um, more support from the government, I think. Um, we have seen some governmental support on a regional level, but there hasn't necessarily been anything uh, centrally. We've done a lot with Innovate UK in terms of grants, but that doesn't obviously fund infrastructure build out. And just to uh, finish in terms of the, uh, the size of the opportunity, but also the size of the challenge in terms of the amount of capital that needs to go into this sector, we're talking about tens of billions, if not 100 billion plus of capital that's required to actually build vertical farming infra infrastructure. At present, we're not looking to supplant um, traditional farms, we can actually work with traditional farms, broadacre farming. Um, but uh, in the future, if the climate continues to go the way that we think it's going, a lot of these, a lot of these traditional farms are gonna have bigger and bigger challenges that they face, so vertical farming could play a, a, a bigger role. Thank you ever so much, uh, Jamie. And uh, we'll, we'll move to, to questions now, and I'll, I'll start with some questions from the chair, but we'll then go to the audience. So please do uh, have your questions uh, ready. I want to pick up on, um, on vertical farming. Um, firstly, it's cost competitiveness um, and some of the barriers to, to scaling it up. And perhaps consider some of the, the supply side changes that the government could make to um, act as an, an incentive. So something around change to planning rules uh, or tax incentives, such as um, you know, a green super deduction for uh, investments in this kind of technology or exemption from business rates in line with conventional agriculture or uh, removing barriers to, to on-site solar. Those kind of things that um, could uh, could help businesses like like Vertical Future. Sure. So uh, there's no there's no doubt that I think a lot of a lot of the vertical farms to date, especially as this has been driven by um, kind of a, a U.S. narrative, have um, used a lot of the kind of underlying pro uh, value propositions like less water, um, you know, greater productivity, and so on and so forth to push up prices. And really, that's not something that we're advocates of. Um, I, th I think the only way that you address the, um, the kind of inequality and, and, and price parity angle is by building at scale. So each product you're growing, whether it's coriander or a head of lettuce or tomatoes, are going to have a particular level of scale that's required and capital investment um, in order to, to achieve that. Um, so I think there's been a lot of bad press um, associated with vertical farms, mostly because we're in, in a very nascent stage for the industry, but things are gradually improving. From a planning standpoint, um, so we've, we've just built a, another vertical farm in Northamptonshire, which was on a, a kind of a sited on agricultural land, so that was much easier. But a lot of the um, larger developments that we're looking at in Perry Urban and, and um, rural areas that aren't on farmland, if you're paying business rates, it really eats into the margins. So it's very, very difficult to kind of um, reach price uh, price parity. So, um, and then final point is that. There's actually very little regulation, so a lot of people are interested in buying a vertical farm. Um, it, it's quite easy to set something up, but setting up something that, that actually makes sense, that links in with sustainable forms of energy and has the, um, you know, the planning uh, approvals for things like solar energy and battery storage and, and integration with wind and so on, um, and I'm also a big advocate of nuclear, um, is, is very, very important and I think is lacking in some areas. Fantastic, thank you. Uh, Henry, I'm going to come to you, uh, if I may. Innovation was a big part of your recommendations in the food strategy, um, in particular on alternative proteins. Could you sort of outline some of the things that you guys were looking at and, and some of the recommendations that you made to, to government? Yes, yeah, so w in order to kind of to, to get that equation right that I talked about, to, to solve food for biodiversity, calories, um, health uh, and carbon... You need to do a couple of things. First of all, you need to be quite explicit about how you're going to use your land. So we need to look much more carefully when we create incentives about which bits of land uh, you incent to do what, because you might want very different things happening in Cumbria, from East Anglia, from uh, the southwest where, I, where, I, where I'm from. The second thing you need to do is we need to eat less meat. So 85% of the land that uh, is currently used to feed Britain, which actually is an area of land significantly bigger than the United Kingdom, uh, is used either to grow meat uh, or to grow plants to feed to meat. 
the, the weight of animals on the planet at any one time um, is ten times the weight of all wild animals and twice the weight of all human beings. So it's just too much, take up too much land. And it is politically incredibly difficult. I don't think we did a lot of work in terms of governments trying to get people to not to eat meat. People don't want to, people actually don't mind sugar taxes. They hate the idea of uh, anyone getting involved in meat. And so there are a couple of ways that you can do that. And one is through alternative proteins. So there are three alternative protein, broadly speaking, technologies. There's uh, taking pea proteins, soy proteins, and just turning them into protein. There's fermenting, so uh, genetically engineering bacteria to produce certain proteins, which is the same process used for making insulin uh, for diabetics. Uh, and then there's actually cellular meat production, so taking stem cells and growing meat in a vat. I actually think the first two of those, I, I, I tend to think that the, the third one will never be cheap enough, it will be too expensive. The first two of those, I think, will be huge, uh, in particular in places like Egypt, who just aren't going to be able to produce that, you know, are much more vulnerable to the Ukrainian situation than us. They want protein security. And I think this government, at the moment, is another area where we've got an opportunity, uh, having come out of the EU, to, uh, there, there are lots of alternative protein companies in this country. I spoke to one just the other day who's saying, the government says it's going to do something, but I've got to make a decision in January, February, about whether I move to the States, whether the regulation clears up, because at the moment, it's the regulation is too strict. So I really hope that is an area where we can keep those companies and keep that innovation in this country. Mm. Eamon, I want to come to you quickly on this, if, if I may. Um, we, we, the government is, is looking closely at how they can attract more investment in this country through uh, tax incentives. Um, would something like a, like a green super, super deduction, so full expensing on, on green capital investments plus 20%, be one mechanism the government could look to use to increase uh, investment in innovative technologies like vertical farming or um, cellular meat or, 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 or others? I think absolutely, yeah. Um, this is obviously kind of a policy that was brought in uh, maybe a couple of years ago, was it? Um, where businesses could um, have sort of uh, a more generous capital uh, allowance on spending they, they made. I think it makes a lot of economic sense. Um, I was very glad um, at the recent mini-budget that um, the, the, the thresholds were sort of maintained at a million pounds going forward, so they were, they were due to stop next year. Um, I think absolutely there's, there's companies you go all around the, the country and it doesn't just need to be green stuff, but you could obviously kind of make a carve out or something like that um, where, where people want to, want to sort of be building things and, and, and creating new um, equipment. And um, at the moment, our tax system, well, uh, previously our tax system kind of disincentivized doing that. Um, so, yeah, I think if we could see those sorts of allowances being... Um, being uh, baked into the tax system, that would be that would be a very good thing. Fantastic. And final question for me: I want to touch on um, our post-Brexit um, farm payment uh, reforms. Um, there's been quite a lot of discussion about this over the past uh, week, Jerome. Um, how important do you think um, public incentives for um, regenerative farming, for example, are going to be not just for hitting our environmental goals, but also for improving our resilience to, to drought, to biodiversity loss, to all these other pressures on, on domestic food production? Um, and where do you think government policy should go to deliver what the minister was saying around accessibility um, of the schemes uh, and value for money and, 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 and other issues that have been raised by, by farmers? Okay, so uh, we're all focusing on elms. I think it's much more fundamental than that. Just this week, I had a meeting with the NFU and the Environment Agency in Norfolk uh, to talk about the removal of water abstraction licenses um, because we've got such water scarcity in, in uh, East Anglia that farmers are having their water, their water abstraction licenses removed. Now, that is a big deal. If we want to carry on farming, that is a big deal. But they're required to by some um, Dutch legislation, weirdly, uh, litigation, rather, uh, to do that. Um, so the, the short-term solution there is building reservoirs. So moving from uh, abstraction from aquifers underground or from rivers to collecting excess winter flow, which we're getting more of because we're getting intense rain in the winter and then longer, drier summers, um, and the challenge that we have right now is a disconnect between what the, envi the Environment Agency is saying we need to do as farmers and what the planning authorities are doing in the regulations and the, the process of getting planning permission 
in order to build reservoirs. And then there's only a certain time of year that you can actually get the diggers out um, for environmental <laughs> reasons. And so farmers are in a really, really difficult position. I don't actually think, as a, I should declare, I'm a director of a farming company as well as being a member of parliament in, in my constituency. I don't think that's fundamentally about uh, government subsidies and the like. That's actually being businessmen looking at the risks of your business and taking steps to mitigate them. Uh, as to what uh, government money should go into farming, I'm a big supporter of the environmental land management scheme. I think the, the concept is absolutely right that we're starting to pay for public money for public goods. That we want to, we want to incentivize, a, first of all, the, the, the stopping the continued decline in biodiversity in this country um, by 2030, which is the government's um, commitment, and then to reverse it. And if we're going to do that, carrying on supporting farmers in the way that farming's happened since 1945 is not the answer. When I, I was born in 1970, since 1970, Henry will correct me, I th think I'm right in saying that 60% uh, of all biodiversity has yeah. been lost since I was born. Just think about that. 20% since 2000. Yeah. So the status quo is not the solution. We do need to focus where there is need for government um, support. It's to buy things which are currently don't have an economic value. And that's where Elms should step in. Fantastic. Um, Joe, uh, Jerome says the status quo is not an option. Uh, do you agree? Uh, I absolutely agree. Um, which is why I'm having a food summit in Stoke-on-Trent on November the 4th to look at this whole food system issue, um, uh, which I've, I've, I've nicked um, the name of Henry's report. <laughs> um, so it's called From Field to Fork, The Future of Food, because we need to have these really, really big debates. Um, we, we talked about the, the urban opportunities. Um, later in the week, you may, may all be uh, going to a presentation on the future of high streets um, and communities and pride of place. And I think that there's a, there's a real role for food growing, vertical growing within an urban setting um, to, to actually re-engage people with the importance of, of, of food, of, uh, of healthy eating, uh, of, of health in general, um, and under food security. So um, we have to have those bigger conversations. They've already been started. Uh, we need to make sure that they, they continue and the new... Uh, administration takes up uh, the uh, well you know the, the research has already been done it's, it's already out there so we just need to enact it fantastic thank you right i'm going to go to audience questions now where the microphone is at the back so we'll start at the back i'm going to take them in batches of three but i'm going to be uh, geographically specific because there's only one microphone and i don't want to lose time walking uh, from one side of the room to the other so we start at the back the gentleman with his hand up in the back at the center yeah yeah uh, brief questions please Sure. My name's Ali. I work for Fair Share with the UK's largest food redistribution charity. Uh, the National Food Strategy said that a third of food is wasted before it even leaves the farm gate. We've got a scheme where we work with farmers to make it cost neutral for them to get their food to charities via our network of warehouses. That was funded by government originally. It no longer is because that funding's been axed. Um, we're seeking the reinstatement of that funding. Joe, you've previously been supportive of that. Um, Jerome, it would be great if you could uh, add your name to the letter that we're writing to the PM. Um, we're at stand B1. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next. Uh, question or statement. <laughs> yeah, let's keep them to questions, please. Um, Helena from the, the Guardian, please. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. So, um, Henry, I spoke to you a while ago about the food strategy when it first came out. You said there are a lot of uh, questions that were not answered that you were hoping they'd be answered in the health inequalities white paper. Well, it seems that's now been scrapped. So do you think the government has no longer got the momentum to change the way that we uh, produce our food and health inequality? Do you think they've stopped caring about it? And to the MPs, um, I'm sorry, it's slightly unrelated, but I have to ask, do you support the government's 45% um, Tax cut, and will you be voting for it uh, when, the, when it comes up in, in Parliament? Thank you. We'll say one more question from the audience, please. Yes, the, the, the lady next to Helena, please. Thank you. Um, yes, um, Isle of Wight, we're semi rural. Obviously, uh, first of all, why aren't we promoting councils to, to create more allotments 
the allotment for a Bryden example is a colossal waiting list and an opportunity for people to grow their own. The, the one thing we have to do in life is eat. Secondly, reservoirs, which have been mentioned. When I watch the water pouring off the fields on the Isle of Wight over the cliff into the sea, I could cry. The Third World War, I was once told, would be fought over water. Anyway, comments, please. Oh, by the way, I attended Fisher Farms. Folks, if you get the chance, have a look on the web. It is phenomenal what Th that man thank has invented. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank you. We're, we're going to put these questions to uh, the panellists uh, now. Henry, can I ask you to take both the question on food waste, but also the question from Helena on uh, health inequalities uh, white paper as well? So on health inequalities, that's, I think that's tomorrow's sessions is health. So there are two areas where I think there is, is jeopardy at the moment in terms of the recommendations from the food strategy. The one is ELMS, which we've talked about. So um, as Jerome said, the structure for ELMS, we have legally binding targets in the Environment Bill. In the Agriculture Bill, we have a, a, a commitment that the payments under the, the farm programme will be for public goods, not for other things. But we don't have much else than that. Originally, DEFRA had said there would be a third, a third, a third money into um, sustainable farming incentive for individual farms, then local nature recovery, which is kind of farmers working on a catchment area scale, and then landscape recovery, which is a big uh, restoration. And that is what is currently up in the air. And there's a fantastic team on DEFRA who've been working on that in great detail. I think that... It's really important that lands properly, and I hope that um, the, the new administration, when they come in and do that, do the right thing in that area. The other area is the health and equality white paper. So that is um, uh, the uh, how do we deal with the fact that our food is killing people, and it's particularly killing poor people. Uh, and you know, and to give us a, a sense of how bad it is, Chris Whitty, probably the world's busiest man during the pandemic, gave a series of online lectures on diet-related disease like in his free time because he is so scared about what's going to happen is the NHS is just going to suck up, as well as the misery, the NHS is going to suck up the money from the rest of the economy until we sort this out. Yeah. And the, the Sajid Javid was about to publish an inequality white paper when uh, Boris resigned. Uh, the rumour is that Therese Coffey's pushed it back again. You know, it's going to either way. The system's got to change. It'll either change because it collapses or because we do something about it. And I really hope to raise a very detailed, focused uh, person. It's very interesting. People go into the health service thinking, oh, "I don't believe in this nanny state stuff," da, 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 and then they see the problem, and like one after another, they're like, "Shit, we've got to do something about this." So I hope that she will be seeing that, seeing the data, visiting hospitals realising there's a problem and then doing something about it. Um, Jerome, anything you want to, to, to add to that? And particularly um, the question, perhaps on, on food waste, but also the, the third one on, um, uh, on uh, homegrown food. Yeah, okay. and 45%. Yeah. yeah. So uh, on food waste, it sounds like a good idea. I can't comment on the particular programme that you put forward, but I'll come and visit you on stand B1. Uh, as to 45% growth, um, I'm going to take it because it's obviously a, you know, it's an important issue. I'm just going to say there are, there are two answers to that question. One's political, the other one's economic. On the economy, it's absolutely the right thing to do because you look at the data and it supports this. The last time the top rate of income tax was reduced, the percentage of tax that was received from that cohort went up. So if we're interested in supporting the poor and our national uh, services, we want to talk about getting tax revenue, not having a sort of virtual signaling, we need a higher rate of tax because they're rich. So economically, it's absolutely the right thing to do, and Labour agrees with us. Why do I say that? Because they were in power for 10 years as a Labour government under Tony Blair and Gordon Brown, and for all but a month of those 10 years, they agreed that the correct top rate of tax was 40%. So economically, we, it's absolutely the right thing to do. Politically, we can see over the last few weeks, it's a more nuanced argument, I think it's fair to say. Um, as for uh, allotments, Madam, they're brilliant. Uh, they should be encouraged. That's the sort of level that parish councils can get involved. If you've got a bit of 
local land, often villages have uh, local land which they can uh, adopt for allotments, and it speaks into the very, very important and conservative concept of social capital. And there's going to be an announcement this evening at six o'clock, um, a pamphlet being co-authored by myself, but largely driven by uh, Danny Kruger MP, talking about the importance of social capital, so I'm just going to put a pitch out there. Pardon me. Oh, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. We're going to our, our next batch of audience questions. Um, can we start with uh, Adrian on the... Hi, a question for Henry Dimbleby. Given the increased cost of farming in a 1.5231 world, I'm fascinated to know why you think uh, alternative protein production will still not be competitive. Could you just elaborate on that for, for, for a moment? Next question from the gentleman in the, in the, in the side. Yes. Hi, yeah, sorry. Uh, question also for Henry. Um, I'm sure you will have seen uh, an interview with the Environment Secretary uh, this week where, when asked if uh, the public should reduce their meat consumption, he said, no, they shouldn't, they should eat what they like, and that the private sector innovation in animal feed would, would sort of solve the problem. Uh, what's, could you comment on that? And the gentleman actually, yeah, pass the mic, thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, Nick Palmer, Compassion World Farming. Um, in the uh, aftermath of the discussion on meat, um, would the government at least agree that it would be helpful not to actively promote increased meat production? For instance, uh, schools are required to serve meat a certain number of times per week. Uh, the AHDB promote it. Um, wouldn't it be good if the government was at least neutral? Fantastic. Uh, thank you. Henry, could you take the first two questions, please? I could take the third as well, because I, I chaired the group that drafted those regulations. Go for it. Go for it. So, so um, on, just on uh, out protein, uh, actually it's just one form, the cellular, so the, where you take the stem cells and then feed them a solution. That one just seems to be miles behind the other. So where something like fermented milk powder, 60% of the milk powder that uh, New Zealand sells to China, of milk that New Zealand sells to China is in the form of powder. Very soon, that is going to come down below the price of actually putting that through a cow. Why on earth would you put it through a cow? So I, I, it's just a one form of, of, of production. That, but then there are people uh, much richer uh, than me who are investing a lot of money in it, so I may well be wrong. Um, uh, on... Um, School on meat and kind of the idea of why government are giving the promoting the message. Um, so we, I, I did a piece of work for Michael Gove when he was in education uh, on on school food, which ended up with um, universal and free school meals, cooking being passed on the curriculum, and we changed the food standards from kind of technical science based standards to food based standards. And one of the ways at that time in which we tried to get iron up and protein up was to have meat on the menu, I think twice a week, if I remember. I don't think that's appropriate now, so I wouldn't actually... I, 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 I'm going back to talk to DFE about that. I think you should enable schools to, to manage for protein and not have to put meat on. And then in terms of uh, Ranel, uh, I completely understand why politicians don't want to talk about it. So we did... As part of the work on the food strategy, we, I raised some money outside government uh, and asked Isaac Levito, who was the Tory uh, kind of election strategist, to do some focus groups on the recommendations. So I wanted to be able to present government with the recommendations saying, here they are and people want to do them. We did focus groups all over the country, Red Wall constituencies, all different demographics, and they were fascinating. So on things like health and sugar tax, People are fed up with being having their children flogged crap. They were actually very much in favour of ad advertising regulations. They were very much in favour even of a sugar tax. When you started talking about meat, a significant minority, about 40%, got very, very angry indeed. And that's why in the recommendations in the food strategy, I actually said, I don't think it is politically doable for a government to do this. So... That's why we said put, put money into alternative proteins, um, uh, change the uh, buying stance so people can buy less meat from government. And actually, I'm working with, there's a big advertising agency who read the food strategy, 
who is doing all putting all their pro bono work towards trying to create a campaign to kind of get get away from the idea of eating less meat being a kind of militant vegan thing to do and just try and encourage us all you know we need to we need to reduce about by about 30 percent that's about one meatball a day so it's like not it's not uh, a huge shift and i do think that's something that can be done without the heavy hand of the state being required to do it can i just add that not all meat is the same there is uh and overwhelmingly british produced meat is much better for environmentally than uh, many other forms of meat which come in at the lower end. So, um, and you're quite right, you don't want, as a politician, to be telling people what to do, particularly as a conservative politician. We need to be giving choices, better and better choices, better and better information, and let people decide for themselves. But I would say that um, British-produced, high-quality meat is good for the environment in terms of biodiversity management uh, in many areas, and it's, it's uh, not all meat is the same. Um, Joe, I'm going to come to you briefly on that, on that topic around uh, diet, but also particularly the role of the, the public sector uh, and public sector procurement uh, in driving, um, in sourcing more sustainable, locally produced food, which is a lower environmental footprint, but is also healthier uh, for people using our public services. Absolutely. So I think um, there is certainly a really big role in public health that, that we currently aren't, I think, fulfilling in terms of... Um, advising people on nutrition, advising children in schools. Um, I was um, in, uh, uh, we've got the, the worst dental health um, problems in Stone Cold Trent of children with, with tooth decay. And um, there's a big, a big um, thing called Keep Stoke Smiling where they go into schools and try and persuade schools to take out their, their fizzy drink machines. Um, and you'd think that that's, that's logical, but, um, there's also um, you know, a suggestion this is about free choice and it's not that harmful. I think we need to be honest about what is harmful and what, um, w without being too... I, I try to move away from the term value state because we, we all know, you know it, it, is, it is so emotive and, and, it, and it suggests that it's in some way anti-conservative and anti-free choice. And, it, and, it, and that's absolutely not what it's about. But I think we do have a responsibility to, to share the knowledge that we have about public health issues and um, you know the, 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 the problems with, with diet, um, obesity, all these things have to be have to be discussed in a much more um, neutral way I would say so that, that we, it, it doesn't stigmatize people um, and the education that we need to provide you know has to be through our schools as well as uh, I would say a, you know, a much bigger campaign. Um, and certainly, in terms of public sector procurement and everything, you know, we, we should be having good food in our schools and our hospitals, um, and we need to define what good food looks like. And I've been calling for a good food bill. Um, I think that that is is fundamental to us understanding how we how we change the dynamic. Thank you very much. I'm going to take the, the last batch of audience questions. We, we really are running out of time, so please keep your questions very brief, and then we'll, we'll seek brief uh, responses from the panellists. Can we start with the, the gentleman? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Uh, does the panel feel that the rate of change from the government meets the needs of the problems we're facing? Fantastic. Thank you. And the gentleman in front? Yes, thank you. Um, one of my big bears is, is putting solar panels on grade one, grade two farming land. I mean, there should be no discussion. It goes on the building roof, not in the land. Um, in Norfolk or on the Norfolk Suffolk border, they're trying to talk about putting two and a half thousand acres down to this. That can't be right. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, final question. Um, yes, the gentleman there, pass my phone along. One of the problems with our food supply at the moment is uh, the depletion of trace elements and minerals in the soil. Um, if we go for increased yields again, this will surely diminish even further the amounts of, say, magnesium in our soil. Um, if we have vertical farms, I don't know where we add it. Thank you, thank you. We've got to go, go, seek responses now from, from our uh, panelists. What I really want, though, is somewhere I can reference. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Right, um, Jamie, I want to come to you. Is the pace of change adequate for the challenges that we're facing? No. 
Okay. Um, okay. Um, really quick. On on solo, who wants to take the solo? Solo quick. Eamon, can you come on 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 solo? Uh, yeah. I mean, I, I I generally on these issues think people should be able, allowed to do what they want with their land. I think when we've seen, particularly during the leadership contest, things about like banning onshore wind and then maybe um, people wanted to bring it back. Um, I think let people do what they want with their land. Within reason, I think there are certain caveats need to place around that and sort of community consent and things like that. But I think there is. Um, there's a lot more willingness for this than people might think. Um, so yeah, let's let's get that that ban lifted. <laughs> Jerome, um, you might want to say something on yeah. solar, but also soil health as well. Yes. So on solar, it's about the compar comparative utility. So the, the the quality of the use of that soil and that land for agriculture compared to other uses. And I think it's a cost benefit analysis on a, almost a field by field basis. Uh, you and I are neighbours in Norfolk. Best place to be. And you're right, we've got very good quality land in the main, so it's unlikely that the, the utility would be better served by solar panels uh, when you've got very good um, uh, uh, land. Uh, the rate of change, all government moves too slowly, that is just the human condition. But this government has done more for the environment than any other in history, and we as Conservatives should be enormously proud of the steps that we've taken, both in terms of the Environment Act, bringing in elms, uh, removing ourselves from the common agricultural policy, which has been so devastating to not only our land but the whole of Europe, and the environment and the environmental protections and degradation that has happened as a result of that. So we should be enormously proud of what we've achieved, but there's more to go, and we shouldn't take a step back as this administration changes. And finally, on trace elements, I am totally ignorant, so I can't give you the answer. Okay. Yeah, I'd like to hear from Jay because I'm always uh, interested in whether that's a long-term concern. So there are no peer-reviewed studies that will show that a um, vertically farmed product versus something grown in a broadacre farm will be any you know, less healthy for you. Um, they're very, very similar. What we do in vertical farms is we take in water from mains, so it's recycled, we strip it down, we then add different nutrients, and then we add micronutrients. And obviously, as the water then comes back through the system, some of those are lost, and we, we add again. Uh, but it's a, kind of a bit of a misnomer. I, th I think the great thing about not, not using soil, if you take two bags of soil, they're going to have very different properties. They're going to have lots of bacteria, lots of insects. And if you grow that in an indoor, very controlled environment, you, you lose that control. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you, Jamie. We're going to have to uh, leave it there, I'm afraid, as we are now uh, out of time. Thank you to our speakers for that uh, excellent uh, discussion, to our sponsor, uh, Vertical Future, for uh, enabling us to put on this discussion uh, today. Uh, the next event in this room is on energy efficiency uh, with the Minister, Lord Callanan. Uh, and if you are not already, please do sign up as a SEND supporter for free on our website. There's a QR code on our leaflets as well, so it's nice and easy. Please do sign up to, as a SEND supporter and you'll get to pitch blogs, come to our events and be part of the SEND community. Uh, thank you very much and have a great conference. Yeah. Nature of these things. <laughs> when you when you when say this government, which, which one do you mean? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, come on now. I mean, don't, don't, yeah. you, you guys have got loads of priorities as well. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. Um, there are offices. There's. Laszlo Barabasi. He's an American physicist who made his name. He wrote an amazing book called Linked. He made his name looking at networks and like the internet and, the, and, and like pointed out some of the problems with the internet and he's now working on food and he's constructing Cheers, a database yeah, right, yeah. called the hidden chemicals in food so uh, yeah they've got to see you around there you can yeah, I'm doing another one tomorrow there you are. So basically, you know, he's saying like yeah, the USDA, I think they, they list 160 or 600 different nutrients, and in garlic there are 18,000. And he's trying to map those, and then he's looked at processed foods and shown that even though at a macronutrient level they look the same, when you look at the stuff that isn't even the USDA, they're very different. And he's beginning to say. Maybe, you know, think about maybe this is where the bio processed food is actually going. So it'd be just worth, in terms of your stuff, just keeping an eye on Laszlo Barabasi. Laszlo Barabasi. Laszlo Barabasi. Harvard. Harvard. Uh, but I mean, he's got a big, he's being funded by Rockefeller to create this big data. I'll tell Jack, he'll remember that. Hi, hi, hi. Uh, hi, Thomas from HSI. Oh, hi, hi. Hi, how are you? Yeah, how are you doing? Hello,
I'm, I'm speaking on your next panel. So. Uh, I mean, yeah, I don't. I, I, I haven't had a glass, so yeah, probably needs fresh ones, I guess. That's all right. I'm going to go to the loo. You know where the best, nearest loos are.